And then there was two geisha girls. Well, hello there. Just joshing with the fellas a little bit. Well, some folks have wondered why we're doing episodes of Average Joes. Well, because wars have been fought by the average Joe. That's why. And the way these idiots are revising our history, we're not going to have any history left. Welcome to another episode of Stories from the Museum. This is a continuation of the Bill Gillette story. In the first part of the Gillette story, we learned how Bill Gillette's son, Steve, brought in a Ziploc baggie full of artifacts that nobody knew anything about. What evolved was the discovery of many photographs and artifacts from Bill's experience in the 445th Bomb Group of the famous mighty 8th Air Force that was stationed in England. Also, the connection of Bill with famous actor Jimmy Stewart, as well as my own father's connection with Jimmy Stewart and Strategic Air Command. And also, an anecdote about General Bill Crumb, the highest ranking casualty of the Vietnam War. And to show how all of these things are interrelated and the possibility of, of interesting things happening, we actually have on video a 90 plus year old veteran of Bill's group, the 445th, on a visit to our museum. When Bill Gillette's widow, Dolores, heard about the museum and uh, we were contacted, and Steve came by, she also told her neighbors and uh, we, we met over at Dolores' house. It was Pat Wood and Bill Willis. Hello, I'm Patricia Wood. My friend Dolores told me about Richard's museum that he's working on. So we're here and I've got several things that I would like to show. One is um, a soldier that used to live with us in England and some interesting stories about him. And also about my dear brother. He now lives in Australia, but he was on the HMS Formidable in the Pacific. And he was on the aircraft carrier that was damaged by the, and I can't say the word. Kamikaze. 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 Yeah. And I have photos here to show Richard. Um, I guess that's it for our air raid shelter, right. World War II. And right now it's... Um, a shed in a garden. Um, when my dad was alive, that was his little shed. That was his pride and joy. But in the war, it was all oh, two thirds underground, and we used to crawl in the little door, which was different then. And um, anyway, there were six of us in this uh, little uh, air raid shelter, and the four cats. And I don't believe it was much bigger than a dining room table. How long do you have to stay in there at a time? I remember staying there in there nearly one whole night. We definitely slept there. Yeah, wow. Yeah. You slept there at six people? And, and Mum would take this plastic bag with loads of washcloths, all wet, ready to be gassed. If we were going to be gassed, she says it will help. <laughs> but she had one for the cats, each of the cats, <laughs> and one for all of them. These soaking wet. Uh, I don't know if it would have helped. We had gas masks anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> So how did you, I mean, you were mentioning something about the, you could hear the planes coming? Oh, or? most definitely, because uh, I, I was very young. Uh, yes, I looked up at the sky, and it was, I can still remember that low droning noise. That's all I can um, say about it. But it seemed to me that there was hundreds up there, all these lights going across, and, of course, all the flashlights, too, at the same time. It was quite spectacular. Oh, and also, when we were in the shed, in the air raid shelter, when the bombs dropped, we could hear this long, mm. high-pitched whistle. And when we started to hear the whistle, all us kids had to count to six, because when number six came up, that's when you Boom. heard the crash, which that's how it happened. Wow. Yes. How, how, were any, any hit close to you? Uh, uh, well, um one place where I worked when they rebuilt it, let me think. Probably about three miles away. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. my dad, he worked for the Skefco Ball Bearing Company, and it was his day to go to the cafeteria and get the tea for all the men. And when he went to the cafeteria, his shop was hit. 
Yeah, so, yeah. Well, ball yes, bearing factory is a real high right. target. Oh yes. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, so uh, where was this? Where was this garden in your house located in? Luton, England. L U T O N. It's thirty five miles north of London. Okay. And I did hear that we were second on Hitler's list mm -hmm. for being hit. Because it was an industrial town. Oh, or? very big mm -hmm. industrial town. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Did you take your large sandwiches down? In was at the seaplane base at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. He was a Pearl Harbor survivor. Bill's story will be talked about later on with another connection to the museum. Pat later brought in artifacts that she had from the war. It seems there wasn't enough housing for the English troops, so they would go out and one day they knocked on the door of Pat Wood's family to inquire if they had a room to rent, which they did, which was a mother-in-law apartment in the attic. He later recounted to the family how he was a motorcycle courier in the army and that he was assigned to deliver a satchel to an address in London. This address was in 1944 and no one was there. So he slept underneath a bush until the next morning when uh, the occupant came out of the house and saw him and said, uh, you must be the courier. Good job, lad. And took the satchel, which had been handcuffed to him. So, according to the story, the address was number 10 Downing Street, and the individual there was Winston Churchill. And according to the story, that satchel contained the plans to D-Day. Well now, that's quite a story. And we just kind of wrote it off as, you know, just another war story and didn't think much of it. However, later Pat brought in a status card sent by John Livingstone to her family to explain uh, how he was doing during the war. He made a note on this status card stating that he was aboard the HMS Dockers and that the date was D-Day plus two, the 8th of June, 1944. So just what was an enlisted motorcycle carrier doing aboard the command post of the British invasion at D-Day. Could it be that John Livingstone actually was a spook? After the war, John Livingstone returned to the mother-in-law apartment of Pat Wood's family and stayed there until he died. He never married. So the true story of John Livingston really needs to be told. Perhaps somebody that's watching from England may be able to help out and fill in the story. But that's not the end of the story. Pat then told her brother, Grenville Dixon, who at the time lived in Australia, about the museum and what she was doing with the artifacts. He then sent to us information about his experiences aboard the HMS Formidable aircraft carrier during World War II. After participating with the Formidable in the sinking of the Tirpitz in the Atlantic, the, the Formidable was sent to the Pacific. It was here that the Formidable was hit by a kamikaze and nearly sunk. Dixie was part of the fire suppression team that was able to put the fire out and save the Formidable, for which he was awarded a medal. He later designed the logo for all of the Formidable correspondence for all the veterans that served aboard the ship. So from a Ziploc baggie, all of these stories developed, and there's more to come. Stay tuned, check back for our other episodes, 
And maybe when you see how this all ties together, you could be inspired to find stories in your own area to save your own history because it's, it's going to be gone if we don't do it. Well, thanks for watching, but now it's time to sign off. Sayonara.